Namaste. <laughs> so I'm on my roof. So there might be a little noise. <laughs> but I have an interesting story to tell. And I was reminded of this story by one of the commenters. He said, weren't you the guy who did the orgone experiments back in the days? And I'm, well, yeah. <laughs> this is a really wild tale from the 1960s. Back in 1963, I was a high school student in New Jersey, and I was a physics prodigy. I was in line for a scholarship to MIT and all that. And in my very broad readings at that time, I came across a German scientist by the name of Wilhelm Reich. So Reich had done ex experiments in orgone energy, which he claimed is the vital energy, the living energy in beings. Well, I thought this is awfully interesting. And I had access to a shop, actually a couple of different shops, my grandfather's wood shop in the basement that I kind of inherited from him. And the shops at, at school, the metal shop and wood shop, all kinds of tools and stuff. So I started to build some of the equipment and duplicate some of Reich's experiments. And of course, uh, being a high school, what junior and senior at the time, I entered in the science fair, the local science fair. Well, I won the local science fair. Uh, but then when I went to the state science fair, I got shot down. And I thought the arguments that the people who dismissed my work used were uh, quite specious, to say the least. They said, well, it hasn't been proved scientifically that this orgone energy exists. And, of course, that was what my experiment was all about. It turns out, if you have a gold leaf electrometer, which is a way of measuring electrostatic charge, and you put it in an orgone energy field, it will discharge much more quickly than if it's just left to itself. And I had proved this. This was my basic experiment in my science project. But they wouldn't accept it because, after all, orgone energy doesn't exist. <laughs> Duh. Anyway, I let the whole thing go. I let it drop because um, I really wasn't interested in becoming a scientist. I was much more interested in becoming a musician. So instead of going to MIT for nuclear physics, I went to a conservatory and studied musical composition, which was much more fun. And I met some really cool people and had a blast. And fast forward five years later, it's by this time 1967, 68. I'm in California. And I'm in a place called Lagunitas, which is in Marin County, just north of San Francisco in the Redwoods. And I'm living in Janis Joplin's house. <laughs> That's a story in itself, how that came to be. But anyway, I meet this really 
beautiful girl. Um, she's half Native American, you know. She's got like the cheekbones and stuff happening. But she's blonde. And I'm like, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> Uh, I'm confused here. It turns out she's half Native American and half Irish. Anyway, we get together and we start living together. She's she's living with me there and with the band I was in at the time in Janis Joplin's house. Some of the old members of uh, the Holding Company. Remember Janis Joplin and the Holding Company? Well, you have to be an old geezer like me to remember that. But anyway... We had a band, and one day we were hanging out, playing music, and, you know, uh, doing experiments in vaporizing uh, er strains of uh, herbal um, leaves. <laughs> and um, these people showed up in suits. And this was like the weirdest thing that ever happened to us <laughs> as hippies in San Francisco was to have suits show up. And these guys are really the prototypical men in black. They're like, well, we can't tell you what agency we're with, but we work for the government and uh, we want to talk with you. Remember that science experiment you did back in the high school days? And I'm like, yeah. The one that I got all kinds of criticism for? Mm hmm, that one. Well, turns out some of this work may have defense applications. And uh, you are probably the only guy in the U.S. who has done these experiments, and we'd like you to go further into it. And we'll provide you a cover. <laughs> Confirmed. <laughs> A cover identity and situation, and we'll uh, pay you generously, and you have to go to New Mexico and work in the government laboratories there, but, uh, you know, this is all hush-hush, top secret, blah, blah, blah. We're already investigating you for a security clearance, so you're going to come, right? I said, well... Let me ask my girlfriend. So I asked my girlfriend, and she says, New Mexico? Oh, that's where the Indian side of my family lives. We're Navajo, and we're in the reservation there in south of Albuquerque, New Mexico. So it also turns out that's exactly where one of the laboratories where they want me to work is, Sandia Labs. So anyway... We kind of make an agreement. And it's like, all right, you have two weeks to show up in New Mexico at Los Alamos. So I'm fine. Yeah, just, you know, give me the money. <laughs> so they gave me a generous amount of money, and I packed all my things into my van. Me and my girlfriend took off, and we go to New Mexico which was mind-blowing for me because I hadn't been outside of New Jersey <laughs> and the San Francisco area. So to see this amazing uh, desert landscape was just mind-blowing. Anyway, so we get to Los Alamos and my cover is that I'm working as a dishwasher in a little cafe. So there I am working like four hours a day, just for lunchtime. And then in the, in the evening, I go into this super, super top secret hush-hush lab, and I recreate these experiments that I did when I was in high school, which actually proved the existence of the orgone energy, just like Reich said. So they said, okay, now we want you to... to do something more. We want you to see if you can beam it, if you can direct the energy. And so we did some brainstorming and we figured that, well, maybe if we use sound waves, sound waves or maybe an electric or magnetic field, we can beam the energy, turn it into a ray kind of a thing. 
Okay. So this required more equipment than was available there, uh, especially more shops and stuff. So we went down to Sandia. We went down to Albuquerque. And this time my cover was I was working for Hewlett Packard. <laughs> Hewlett, good old HP. Back in the days before they made computers, or actually they were just getting into computers, but they made mostly lab equipment. So I had a perfect excuse to go out to the base, Sandia base, and visit the labs, which I did quite often. And so we built a bunch of gear and stuff and did a bunch of experiments and stuff. And this was also the time when I was living south of Albuquerque near the Navajo reservation and was doing a lot of ceremony with the Navajos. And, you know, even though I wasn't supposed to tell them, I told them what I was doing. And they say, you better be careful. These guys are going to try to screw you. Because that's the way they operate. White men have forked tongue. Huh? So I, I was on the alert. But anyway, the experiments were going pretty well. And, you see, I had already learned from Ali Akbar Khan about... Indian music, Vedic music, and how the intervals are made with integral ratios of sound vibrations. And this is very healthy and is called uh, swara. Swaras are these musical intervals. Turns out all this 432 hertz stuff is a bunch of bullshit. It's the intervals between the notes that make the music healing. And this is the secret of Vedic music. It's thousands of years old, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, we found when we exposed the organ accumulators and generators to this type of sound vibration, it indeed it did form it into a beam. So everybody was happy. We were going on. Um, and they said, okay, well, now this is where we want to take the next step and turn this into a weapon. We want to add radioactivity, nuclear energy. Now, I don't know if you know anything about Wilhelm Reich, but this is where he screwed up. He tried to mix the orgone energy and the nuclear energy, and it created something that he called Oranur, which turns out was extremely toxic to all kinds of living beings. So, I said, no, that is not going to fly. It's very dangerous. You're liable to hurt somebody, especially yourselves, if you're working on it in the lab. And when this stuff is used, it creates contamination, and we don't know how long it takes to, uh, to dissipate this really, really negative energy. I'm not going to do it. So, of course, this was a big flap. And short, Long story short, I wound up getting terminated from the program. So, you know, they had to uh, make up an excuse for me to leave the cover uh, job that I had. So they arranged that I would get busted for pot. Nice guys, huh? And so I had to leave the state, and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And when I got back to California, <laughs> it was so funny. Nobody would believe my story. Nobody. Zilch. Zero. Zip. The guys who had seen the, the men in black come and interview me had moved on. I didn't know where they were. Turns out they went back to Tulsa, Oklahoma, or wherever they were from. And uh, nobody would believe me. So I kind of just quietly dropped it. <laughs> and that's been the status until, well, basically today. So I just thought I would uh, fill you in on that little episode in my life, which is when I met the men in black and got shanghai for a top secret uh, nuclear weapons program in New Mexico. Aum <laughs> Tutsa. Aum Shakti Aum.